Welcome back to Tuesdays Off The Ball. Richie McCormick here with you until 10 o'clock tonight. A little bit later on, we'll be talking to excellent dog boss Vinnie Perth in the wake of Shamrock Rovers 3-0 defeat away to Ludogorets in the second qualifying round of the Champions League. Rovers right up against it ahead of the return leg in Tallis Stadium a week from tonight. Uh, but first, joining us to discuss all manner of issues, uh, we'll get to Manchester United and their pre-season tour of Australia and the forever booing of, of Harry Maguire momentarily. But John Bruin joins us on the line. I'm delighted to say welcome back to the show, John. Uh, good evening, Richie. How are you? Not too bad, thank you. Not too bad. Um, I know you're a bit of an aficionado as it comes to, to football documentaries. I know this Arsenal all or nothing would have oh. caught your eye a little bit later on. Um, like, what did you make? It's hard to gauge anything by the trailer. Um, but yeah, what, yeah, did, what did yeah. you make of Mikel and Co from the bit we've seen so far? <laughs> well, yeah, I got a, I, I've got a press release this afternoon uh, and yeah, clicked on the YouTube. Um, yeah, uh, very much son of Pep Guardiola, uh, overused <laughs> for guys. Um, and those set pieces um, in the Arsenal dressing room looked quite similar to the Pep Guardiola stuff from City's version. That was an all or nothing as well, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm told actually that uh, Mikel was not fully on board with this project. And I think he's, I mean, if you actually look at his mentions of it in his press conferences last season, you, you would see that. Um, so uh, with, all, <laughs> with all these things, there's that element, isn't there, where it, it feels very, very staged. Uh, he's not a natural performer like Jose Mourinho, who I think saw that as a chance to to soften his public image. And I think that worked, actually. Um, and Pep Guardiola, well, uh, Pep uh, is a guy I think he's had four or five documentaries made about him. He's pretty comfortable in that arena. I'm not sure Mikel Arteta is quite so comfortable. Though, um, if I may say, there's someone who seems quite fond of himself. Um, so maybe he might grow into that a bit more. Yeah, I'd say if there's a, a series two, Mikkel will suddenly find himself on board with that. Like, do you think, like you mentioned, there is 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 overuse of the the term guys? Like, I remember, like when I worked uh, in HMV many moons ago, they used to have this like managerial system whereby people would go through, you know, they'd be like uh, almost like regional kind of, you know. Uh, team leaders etc so they'd be underneath yeah. the assistant manager and the manager one of the things I remember learning is that they were encouraged to call everybody mate and in managerial courses in HMV you were encouraged to call everybody mate like is this a thing from La Masia where you, boy, you have to call everybody guys or you know a certain that's has to be a certain trigger word to make sure that there's a level of friendly that's not too friendly but it's friendly enough it also has a bit of, air of an air of authority I've long had a, a, a problem with the word guy I've always felt it's uh, quite insincere. But when I go back up to the northwest of England, I hear that it's used quite a lot. It's used quite a lot in restaurants. You know, people come over, you know, it's everything all right there, guys? You know, that type of thing. And um, I think Pep, uh, who is, you know, uh, an Atlanticist, and spent a bit of time in America, of course, uh, which is, I think, where he's probably learned the majority of his, say, verbal um, English, picked it up. And Arteta, I mean, he's, Arteta spent 10 years playing in England, didn't he, before he became a manager. Um, it's probably followed along with that one. But, yeah, I've always... It feels insincere, but it's also like an international word, if you see yeah. what I mean. It's, a, it's almost like an Esperanto term. Uh, sort of CNN in your hotel room when you're sat in Bulgaria with nothing to do, that type of thing. That type of word. Translate towards the... Uh... The different kind of people involved in the, in the dressing room, whether they be the Brazilians or French or Spanish Absolutely. or, you yeah, know, yeah. from West Africa or wherever it happens to be. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's got uh, international recognition, I suppose. The word mate probably yet to be uh, to be used in among the natives of Recife Bay or somewhere like that, you yeah. would thought. Well, you see, uh, Eddie Jones, the England rugby manager, has dominion over the word mate, which kind of punctuates every sentence that he says. So... I don't think there's many left uh, to go around for other people around there. Like, like my one, my, I've mentioned it before, nine o'clock there. Like in, in terms of the football documentaries, the behind the wall, behind the scenes, flying the wall stuff. My one is always the go to is the City documentary from '81 that Granada produced yeah. with Mal Malcolm Allison going, John Bond coming in, and the pantomime villain. Like none of these docs that I've seen in the past while, they kind of have a a softening image, as you say, is it for the likes of Mourinho, or they try to get you a bit of personality for the likes of Guardiola or Arteta, you don't get a pantomime villain like Peter Swales in in these documentaries these days, unfortunately. Well, I, 
I think part of that is that people like Peter Swales don't exist anymore. I mean, that, that there is a man very much of his time. Uh, he also makes a, 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 a wonderful cameo in uh, the Graham Taylor documentary as well. well. I think he was chairman of one of the FA boards or something. Yeah, an, an amazing performer. And of course, that, that documentary you talk about there, there's that sort of set piece, isn't there, between Malcolm Allison and John Bond, who'd actually known each other for, I think, 30 years or so. At the time, both who'd come from through West Ham and uh, this sort of enmity between them. And it, again, actually, you don't make him like, like Big Mal anymore. Uh, it would be pretty interesting, actually, if, Mikel Arteta decided to wear a fedora, sip champagne, uh, uh, bring page three models into the bath, which is all what Mark Mallison did. Uh, maybe that's for the next series, as you, as you suggested might happen. Yeah, I think the uh, the idea of Mikel appearing in the first five minutes shirtless, uh, strutting around the uh, the Manchester City or the Arsenal dressing room as it is in this case is probably going to be a little bit beyond them. John, we're going to get back to you on, on matters current in a moment uh, but we're going to take a, a brief ad before that. We were talking beforehand about Mikel Arteta and his uh, foray into the world of documentary with that uh, new All or Nothing series that's coming to Amazon Prime. Uh, it distracts and detracts a little bit away from the inanity, John, of... Uh, pre-season because during the course of the last uh, few days I've seen headlines like uh, Manchester United are back given their level of performance under Eric Ten Hag and their pre-season friendly so far and uh, Liverpool's Darwin Nunez is under pressure despite the fact he hasn't played a competitive game for them yet um, th- the main headline today though that jumped out of United's pre-season game with Crystal Palace was the booing yet again of Harry Maguire it's <clears throat> if it wasn't silly before I think it definitely is now yeah, um, it, it feels to me as if uh, those supporters over in Australia, and there were well, many tens of thousands of them in the MCG, uh, were almost like copycat behaviour uh, of what went on at Old Trafford. Now, I used to attend Old Trafford at a time when it was strictly verboten to uh, boo any players. And I think the first I remember this ever happening to uh, was Neil Webb when he left the pitch very slowly uh, during a, a vital game against Nottingham Forest. And then we'd probably be nearly 20 years until it happened again uh, when, when you know, things started going a bit wrong for Manchester United. Um, I, I have a lot of sympathy for Harry Maguire. Uh, I think uh, he played a lot of last season injured. I think uh, he was a player who has to fit into a system. Uh, the system he fits into best is that uh, the England player in the Gareth Southgate, not the one that uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer had to play when Cristiano Ronaldo came into the team. And it wasn't, and it didn't work either when Ralph Ranić was there. Um, I think, I think it's fair to say that there is this idea, which I would disagree with, that Harry Maguire, 80 million, was overpriced. Um, and you know, I used to watch him play for Paul City and think, there's a promising player, I wonder how far he'll go. And I never thought he'd end up captain of Manchester United. Um, but then again, I never thought he'd star for England in a run to the semi-finals of the World Cup and the final of Euro 2020. So there is a player there. I don't think it helps fans booing him. And that's always been my sense of being a supporter and also a, a, a player as well. And of course, you know, back in the days of Neil Webb, he didn't have social media. And, of course, that adds further fuel to the fire. And so that means that fans in Australia are able to copy that behaviour. Um, who's, who's getting anything out of that, out of booing Harry Maguire? If you're a Manchester United fan, and these people may not be Manchester United fans, they might be a rogue group of Crystal Palace fans down in Melbourne. But um, what are they getting out of that? What, what Booing the player, it's not going to make him any better, is it? I think the um, <clears throat> the Melbourne booing is a case, like you mentioned, of monkey see, monkey do. Like they've seen yeah. the Old Trafford fans towards the well middle part of last end, uh, latter end of last season, when things were just really toxic at United and really did need uh, an, an overhaul and a change. And the sense was the excuses you heard as, as regards for the booing was, well, we're not necessarily booing him, we're booing the concept of playing an out of form player in a failing team and things like that need changing. It doesn't really hold water when it's a pre-season friendly in Melbourne against Crystal Palace. Um, no. And I don't think it will hold water when they have a new manager in there now who's insistent that he retains the captaincy. 
Well, yeah, I mean, okay, if you look at United's transfer business, they brought in you know, Lissandro Martinez, they've already got Rafael Varane. There would be those who uh, don't like uh, or don't trust Harry Maguire that would expect him to move out of the team. But one of the things about Maguire um, is that within a club which is listing pretty badly, he does provide that element of leadership. Okay, we can we can say that Solskjaer as a manager was was ultimately it didn't happen for him, but I think Maguire was an important player and a player that delivered. And it, you know, the last year or so he's played badly, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, as I say, um, Maguire, there, there is a player there, there is someone that can produce something for Manchester United, and I'm, I would imagine the hope is, and Ten Hag appears to believe that if you set up your midfield, that you don't expose your, your centre back who isn't particularly pacey then you can make something of that team and make something of a player who is actually a good organiser of defence and seems to have a pretty decent relationship with the goalkeeper in David De Gea. Um, it, it's, I, I, I don't know. I actually, I, I've actually been to the Melbourne Manchester United Supporters Club back in uh, 1998, right, when I was a, but a young man. Okay. Uh, and we watched uh, England play in the World Cup in 1998. And uh, we, my main memory of it is that... Um, as I left the Harry Ramsden's chippy in which this was held, we <laughs> we walked into the streets, which turned out to be those where Ramsey Street is based. Ah. Neighbours, the now late lamented TV programme. So I wonder if they still base themselves there. Judging by some of the social media videos, it seems to have gone to a bigger place than that these days. But um, the people I met down there did not seem the type that would boo a Manchester United player. But times have moved on, haven't they? Yeah, yeah, I think... Uh, fan bases for clubs have kind of um, grown a little bit since then um, they're probably a little bit more closely held at the time I think the sense that there's a sense of own, like in, there's a sense of ownership around the team for p- people that are based in f- f- the Far East or in Australia yeah, or yeah. in America etc etc in a way that I don't think there was before they felt like they're maybe clinging on to the coattails of a team before whereas now they, they really there is a global sense to these clubs to the Liverpools the Manchester United's that people in America, people in Australia, people in Singapore and Malaysia do hold a little bit of sway in terms of their opinion. Well, yeah, and I suppose that comes down to the finances, doesn't it? Yeah. If you hear people like Richard Arnold, the CEO, speak, they uh, place great uh, importance in attracting those markets and you can see the way that, um, you know, I mean, ultimately, these tours around the world uh, are not what any manager would like. Um for the players, Arsene Wenger was a manager who absolutely loathed going on these tours because it would mean his players were in no condition to start the season. Going to Australia and kicking off in two and a half, three weeks or whatever does not seem very sensible, but it is such a huge part of the profit and loss sheet for these clubs that they have to service these deals, and that's part of it. And, and as you say, yeah, um, again, social media has given people an ownership uh of being a Manchester United fan rather than just they were pretty much used as a cash register before they still are but there is a, there is that extra stake in there now isn't there mm. the social media thing has added that extra dimension not necessarily always a positive one but here we are I'm still trying to imagine the the Neil Webb scenario uh, being played out on social media, particularly how Shelley Webb may have handled that uh, or otherwise <laughs> uh, back in the early 90s and probably Remember another story it, yeah. for another day. Yeah, yeah, uh, people probably need to look that up. Um, social media obviously has a, a massive uh, influence. I don't know, it's probably too strong a word, but it's a vocal thing as regards transfer business. Um, and, and Manchester United have obviously, you know, needed a clear out there's probably one massive asset that maybe needs to be shifted on and they don't know whether or not that can happen or not. But as regards the incomings, there's still a lot of question marks. Like the Lissandra Martinez deal still has to be, you know, rubber stamped. And yeah. they seem to be waiting and waiting and waiting on this Frankie de Jong uh, signing to happen. To such a degree, you're kind of wondering, well, did you not have an alternative in case this doesn't work out? Because there's every chance that this won't. Yeah, yeah. I think the, the dread scenario... Manchester United fans is uh, a midfield of Fred and Scott McTominay lining up, both of whom I should say, by the way, I think are decent players, but probably need a better player around them. Um, listen, if I was in business or the football business, I really would not be wanting to rely on Barcelona at this point. Um, uh, they're 
uh, activities appear to be a little shifty, if I can say that. Um, owing the guy 17 million euros or whatever it is, and then expecting him not to uh, want that money because he loves the club. Well, that's an interesting way of looking at things, isn't it? Um, and uh, you, you have this scenario where, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely correct. Um, it's almost like a Manchester United tradition, though, isn't it? Those big players that United have looked at, fans have pinned their hopes on all summer, and then they've not arrived. I mean, we had Cesc Fabregas infamously uh, back in the summer of 2013. Uh, before that, Wesley Schneider was yeah. linked every every summer. Um, I remember there was one. Meza Ozil was one. Yeah, obviously. But Alex Ferguson was caught watching him in a pre-season game, and that got everyone's hopes up, and he, he went to Real Madrid instead. And um, there just seems to be this one player that... And, and what often happens is that they maybe arrive the next year. Ander Herrera was one as well. I uh, remember all that messing around with uh, lawyers and stuff like that. Manchester United get themselves in these terrible tangles, played out publicly. They get played by the Spanish clubs, who I do think, uh, think uh, see Manchester United coming a little bit. Um, De Jong, uh, obviously a talented player, um, and very talented, and obviously Den Hag will know him well. But I'm not sure that the player that I've seen when I've watched Barcelona is quite worth this fuss. I don't know quite what I'm what I'm supposed to be seeing here. And actually, the fact that Barcelona are willing to get rid of him suggests they hold a not dissimilar view to me on that as well. Yeah, the Barcelona situation is an odd one because I th- clearly, like I read the other day, that they're using money they're getting for a rights sale yeah. now rather than... Uh, using it sensibly going forward and going big now to maybe try and bring the success that they had in recent years but owing as you say 17 million to one player and them not willing to, to cough it up despite the fact that they're finding it for, for Robert Lewandowski is another story the, the, as I mentioned that asset that probably needs to go uh, Cristiano Ronaldo like do we know what the like feeling is around the club as regards whether or not he should go, whether they want him to leave, whether that thing of he's part of our plans, he's going to spearhead our attack. Like, is that all for show, or is there a sense behind the scenes that you know we're actually pretty off, pretty better off getting rid of this lad? Well, the thing is, Ten Hag and his sit down with reporters, which would have been you know, Sunday night going into Monday, um, appeared to. I, 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 don't, I don't get the impression that Ten Hag is yet moved into the to the world of uh, Ferguson-style kidology, um, seems to suggest that he, he's okay with him being around. Um, though, again, maybe he has to say that. Maybe there's commercial deals tied up. But ultimately, uh, there is someone who is tying up an enormous amount of wages. Um, uh, and uh, as I said, um, if you look back 12 months ago, before Cristiano Ronaldo had signed for Manchester United, a lot of people were tipping Manchester United to challenge for the title uh, under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Uh, Ronaldo arrived, and um, within weeks, it was clear that Manchester United were not going to challenge for the title. Now, you can't roll the clock back, of course not, but you can rectify that mistake by trying to get him off the books. And uh, The thing is, with, the, with someone like Ronaldo, because he's in his own nation-state, it's left to him and his representative, George Mendes, and various other acolytes, to ship him around all these clubs. Bayern Munich don't want him. Uh, Atletico Madrid don't want him. There was a link with Sporting Lisbon uh, that came up just the other day, which seems to me to be quite sensible. One of the stipulations is Ronaldo wants to play Champions League football. Sporting Lisbon, who has made his bones as a player. Uh, I think the only public pronouncement we've had on this from Ronaldo is that this was a fake. Well, that's the one that made the most sense to me. Uh, not that we're supporting this, we could afford to pay him any money, but then why does he need the money? Um, this, I mean, Ronaldo's future, if you think about it, was sorted out very late in the transfer window last year. I expect this saga will be played out over a similar time scale this year. Um, it's deeply tedious. It's the question that everyone gets asked. Yeah. And no one really knows the answer to it. And you have to suspect that it's it's almost like a Gordian knot for United and Ronaldo himself. 
a lot of face uh, is trying to be saved at the moment, but someone's going to have to lose face at a certain point, aren't they? It's interesting that like there are this handful of players like Ronaldo, Neymar would fit into that as well, that are so big. And yeah. the notion of them, rather than the reality of them, is so big that there's no room for them to go. Like, Ronaldo has reached a point whereby his wages have ballooned to such a degree that there's only a handful that can afford to pay them. And within that handful, only Manchester United at the moment seem to want them. And even then, that's a bit iffy. Similarly, like, uh, you know, Galtier has gone in at PSG and decided that he doesn't want any bling bling football anymore. Neymar is the kind of, you know, red flag towards all of that. There's no way that anybody else can afford the wages. You end up having these really talented, uh, aging footballers who nobody really wants because nobody can really afford them. And you're kind of wondering who are they for then and what purpose do they serve? Yeah, yeah. And you, you, you know, you've got this this idea of sort of almost solo acts, haven't you? Um, you know, joining some sort of super group. I think, and, and that that is a model that's failed at PSG. We've seen that. I think if Galtier, who's clearly a very, very good manager, is given the chance to construct a proper PSG team around Kylian Mbappe, they might have a decent chance of putting together a decent team. They've signed a player whose name escapes me uh, that Newcastle wanted, the young striker. Uh, Ekatiki. Uh, yes, that's the guy. Yeah. He's really good. Yeah, and that's the type of signing that a club like PSG, that's progressive, should be wanting to make. Not signing the next, or the, you know, uh, signed Lionel Messi, for example, who is still at PSG, let us be put. Yeah. Um, now, you know, there, there, there was some talk over the last couple of days of Inter Miami, some big talk that maybe they would like Lionel Messi for their project. I'm sure PSG, underneath all this, would really like that to happen soon. But again, like the Ronaldo, you can't admit it for whatever reason because you might lose social media likes, you might lose sponsorship opportunities. And so, yeah, you have these these listing Titanic-style ships moving around the waters of football. Um, listen, uh, the, the Ronaldo and Messi era has been wonderful football, um, uh, but I think it's come to an end. And it, it's like all of these things, like all political careers, they sort of end in some element of failure as well, don't they? I mean, the hope would be for, for both of them, they sign off with a World Cup or something like that. But then again, you've got this scenario, Ronaldo thinks he can play till he's 40. Well, who... Seriously, he's going to do that. And um, I remember, you know, back years ago, uh, older players would drop down. Kevin Keegan to Newcastle. Yeah. Um, Johan Cruyff left Ajax Amsterdam and went to Feyenoord and then won the league just because he could in Holland, just to show them. Now, do, do either do, do any of those players, those players you mentioned, Neymar, Messi, Ronaldo, do they not just fancy one last job, like you know, the Dirty Dozen or something like that, and just you know, to pull a club up by its bootstraps, be a hero somewhere smaller, you know, go to go to a club, say like Marseille or you know, even Newcastle, who could probably afford that, and become a hero for, for, for coming to those clubs. It seems that that's not part of the model these days. They have to be attached to these other blue chip companies. And I'm not... And Ronaldo is going to end up almost an act exile from the game that's, that's made him, that, that he has made himself. Just needs to be a, a sense of reality about them that you know you can't necessarily keep earning four hundred, five hundred grand a week just Absolutely. because of the, of the name. Like go like like you mentioned there, and it's kind of brilliantly detailed in in that new Cruyff biography that's out there, like of of Cruyff going to Fine Art and doing it because he can. Now, there was a sense at the time he needed to keep playing because he needed the money. I don't think yeah. Cristiano Ronaldo needs the money, so maybe <laughs> kind of temper your expectations a little bit. Take that move to like who was the one recently? It was like Arjen Robin went back to Groningen. In, in Holland because yeah, there's a good team yeah. yeah so like that that final chapter that kind of valedictory thing of of taking another team and, and being the big fish and uh, bringing a little bit of stardust to them that would be uh, and they'd be remembered fondly more fondly than they would be for demanding 400k to to play the odd match here and there for a, for a big blue chip company as you mentioned yeah and, and another thing that you do wonder is about enjoying the football. Now there is this. There's been this story, hasn't there, about Ronaldo over the summer? You know these um, these very detailed reported pieces on where it went wrong for Ralph Rangnick last season. And one of these ideas was that uh, that Ronaldo wanted training at Manchester United to be 
in inverted commas, fun. Yeah, he didn't want to do the, the hard sweat, you know, the, the, the pressing work that a, a coach like Ralph Ramnick would push. Now, if you want things to be fun, you know, maybe go somewhere where you're allowed to. Um, I mean, at Manchester City, he clearly was allowed to, to do what he liked, but somewhere where, you know, people are going to listen, follow your lead, and, you know, th- th- there must be, a, you know, a small club in, in France, or Sporting this would be a fine example, that he could go to and just keep living the dream and he can still play for Portugal and there was always this idea with Messi wasn't it that he'd go back to Rosario back to Newell's old boys when's that going to happen um, the romance has gone out of the game a bit hasn't it with stuff like that just a bit even going back to Neil Webb taking his last lap around Forest again to bring it back to, to the old <laughs> midfield general at Old Trafford and the city ground um, listen everything always comes back to Neil Webb it always does John Brown thanks so much for taking him out to speak to us this evening uh, lovely to talk to you, Richard. And you, mind yourself. We'll be talking at uh, Shamrock Rovers European Exploits with Vinnie Perth next. Off the ball on News Talk.